When he got on a plane in Portland, Oregon last night, he was just another passenger who gave his name as D.A. Cooper. But today, after hijacking a Northwest Airlines jet, ransoming the passengers in Seattle, then making a getaway by parachute somewhere between there and Reno, Nevada, the description on one wire service, master criminal. Bill Curtis reports. D.B. Cooper is the pseudonym of an unknown man who hijacked a Boeing 727 in the northwestern United States. The story began on November 24, 1971, exactly the day before Thanksgiving in the USA, when a man went to the Portland, Oregon airport. Wearing a business suit with black tie and white shirt, this man bought a ticket to Seattle, Washington, without showing ID because anyone was allowed to travel within the country without showing ID or even an inspection. And he could. B. Cooper escaped without being caught, after hijacking a Boeing 727 and holding everyone inside it hostage, and his case is one of the most puzzles that baffled the FBI. When Cooper boarded a plane he sat in the back seat until Flight 305 departed. In time, Cooper was quiet, drinking and smoking cigarettes. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper handed a note to Florence Schaffner, the flight attendant who was near him. Schaffner assumed that Cooper flirted with her and she dropped the paper without opening it in her bag. Cooper leaned toward her and whispered, Miss, you better look at that paper. I have a bomb. After Schaffner read the note, Cooper told her to sit next to him. Schaffner sat down as he asked, then Cooper quietly showed her the bomb. It consisted of eight red cylinders, four by four, connected by wires covered with red insulator and a large cylindrical battery. After Anne closed the bag, he announced his demands, $200,000 in tradable American currency. Four parachutes and a fuel truck stop in Seattle to refuel the plane on its arrival. Schaffner moved Cooper's instructions to the pilots in the cockpit. When she came back, Cooper was wearing dark sunglasses. Pilot William Scott called air traffic control at Seattle Airport, who notified local authorities. The other 36 passengers thought their arrival in Seattle would be delayed due to minor mechanical issues. The president of Northwest Airlines, Donald Narub, authorized the payment of the ransom, ordering all employees to fully cooperate with the hijackers' demands. The plane circled the airport for about two hours to allow Seattle police and the FBI enough time to collect Cooper's parachutes and ransom money, and mobilize emergency personnel. And when FBI agents collected cash from several banks in the Seattle area, 10,000 unmarked $20 bills, most of them with the same serial numbers that the San Francisco Fed was referring to. At 5.24 p.m., Cooper was informed that his demands had been met, and at 5.39 p.m., the plane landed at Seattle Airport. Cooper ordered the plane to land in a secluded place. All cabin windows were closed to deter snipers, and all passengers except the cabin crew were released. Al Lee, approached the plane that was given. Cooper, the bag, and parachutes, and once the delivery was complete, Cooper ordered the plane to leave for Mexico at the lowest possible airspeed. At about 7.40 p.m., the Boeing 727 took off again but only five people were on board, Cooper, Pilot Scott, Flight Attendant McCullough, Assistant Rutazic, and Flight Engineer Anderson. The government sent with it two F 106 fighter jets, one above and one below. After taking off again, Cooper tells McCullough to join the rest of the crew in the cockpit and stay there. At about 8 in the evening, a warning arrived to the pilot that the door had been opened. McCullough went out and did not find Cooper. He jumped with the health of the coins and two misguidances. The area where he jumped has been identified, a forest between Seattle, where the plane took off, and Reno, Nevada. 
the police have not been able to arrest or identify him so far, despite all the intense searches and the use of a warplane to escort the plane. The weather was bad and the sky was full of clouds, which prevented the pilot of the warplane from noticing the fall of D.B. Cooper. The FBI then assumed that Cooper may have been killed while trying to parachute, due to the high speed of the plane and inclement weather in the area, but his body was not found, after which they believed he was stuck in trees. The process of searching and investigations continued, but to no avail. As for the plane, it continued on its way until it landed at Reno Airport, and none of its passengers or crew were hurt. After the plane landed, investigators began investigations, and found 66 unidentified fingerprints on the plane. Customers also found a black tie, a tie clip and two of the four umbrellas, local police, and the FBI immediately began the process of drawing a close-up of Cooper's face, as described by McCullough and Shanfer, during which time more than 800 potential suspects were questioned. And in 1980, a child found $5,800 in two packages that were confirmed to be from the money given to Cooper, on the banks of the Columbia River five years after the crime, and a human skull was also found in the same area, but it was for a woman, and all this helped investigators only that he put some people under suspicion with the inability to find any compelling evidence, chief among them is Kenneth Christensen, an employee of Northwest Airlines that owns the hijacked plane. He was known for his constant conflicts with the director of the company, as well as for receiving skydiving training. His brother also indicated in 2003 that he was talking about a big secret in his life, but he did not reveal it. Even after his death in 1994, it was found that he owned $200,000, although his family was not aware of this large amount, but the police could not prove that he had anything to do with the crime. In the end, Cooper's case was closed in 2016 without any evidence, and this case is the only one concerned with the unsolved JY hijacking. Opinions differed about Cooper's fate, but the idea was supported and adopted by a senior investigator in 2007 named Larry Carl who said that D.B. Cooper did not survive the jump, especially since he was not a professional delusionist, when he chose the two worst parachutes among the four in addition the money packages supporting this idea were found near the Lewis River Patina Bar, far from the point where he jumped, so it is likely, that the Lewis River that washed up the money that killed Cooper, and the idea is that Cooper could not control the parachute because of the weather, as it was raining and very cold and Cooper could have fallen into the river, in the end, the case of Cooper's disappearance remained one of the most mysterious cases that no one was able to solve and was closed in 2016 after they gave up hope. This topic is very huge and the points that we stood on are only the most important. I hope to see your opinion in the comment. Thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to support us by subscribing if you liked the video see you in the next episode. Bye.